man. One man. All I have to do is eliminate one man because the whole redemptive process and focus of God is on one man. And if I can eliminate the one man, what's the whole deal of all the prophets? Moses. It starts with Moses and the whole the Abraham thing and, and, and bringing in a nation of people. What's the big deal? Well, one man. See, if he can mess up Abraham and mess up the lineage and mess up the plan, if he can get through to Moses, if he can destroy the children of Israel, through which the one man's going to come. Stop the one man. The one man. See, the whole deal is the one man thing. Again, all the prophets, what's all the prophecies about? One man. Everybody's talking about one man. And Israel gets so messed up that they go into Babylonian captivity finally, and hey, the whole thing is over. There is no lineage. There is no, it's all down. The country is gone. Israel is dispersed. So what? For 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is absolutely silent. If your wife hasn't talked to you for 400 years, you'd get the idea she's mad, right? <laughs> well, God obviously is mad at us and he's given up. Can you see the look on the devil's face as he's just in glee and delight because, hey, the one man, the one man thing is over. The one man I've won. The one man never came into existence. The one man that's going to step on my head is finished. And all of a sudden, angels fill the sky and are singing about the birth of one man. One man has showed up. Shepherds are running wild all over town talking about one man. Oh, he's born. Going to step on the head of the devil. One man. One man. One man. Wise men are bowing at the feet of Herod the king is all upset about. This is the whole deal. So baby boys are all killed in, in Jerusalem or in Bethlehem and the surrounding district. And the devil again wipes his hands and says, hey, I win the one man. He's never going to grow up to be the man. I've finished him. And can you imagine 30 years of age, Jesus steps forward and announces his ministry and miracles begin to take place. And the devil, oh, that's where the wilderness temptation took place because the devil's all bent out of shape. Whoa, one man. I thought I took one man. He's going to step on my head. One man. <coughs> one man. That's the whole deal. One man. Plot. Plan, manipulate, get committees together, fight. Pharisees, Sadducees, Israel, crucify him. Got rid of the one man. Three days later, oh, he's back. <laughs> Stepping on my head. <laughs> Woo, one man. A sense of the right, one man. Coming back again, one man. See, the whole deal of salvation focuses on. So when the leadership of Israel says, come on, where do you get off? What's the core issue? What's the big deal? What's going down? Hey, we know it isn't suppers. We know it isn't miracles. We know it isn't theology. What's the big deal here? Peter stands forth and says, thank you. Somebody's listening. Oh, praise the Lord. One man, one man, one man. That's phenomenal. In fact, in verse 12, he says, nor is there salvation in any other man. The word salvation is used twice in the passage. Verse 12, it's used twice in that one verse. There's two independent statements. Nor is there salvation in any other, 
Then he turns around and says, on the other hand, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So you've got two completely independent, stand on their own statements, both saying the same thing. Salvation, the word salvation is used in each one of them. In the first one, it's used as a noun. Nor is there salvation... In the second statement, it's used as a verb. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Noun, verb. The Greek word is so so. It literally is used 54 times in the New Testament. 14 times it's used for the deliverance from disease and demonic possession. 20 times it's used for personal peril where you're threatened with the issue of death. 20 times it's used for, for spiritual deliverance, where the very damnation and ruin of all of sin that comes upon the life is suddenly just removed from your existence, and you enter into salvation. What a word. I'm a little concerned about the church in the fact that we have a tendency to take the issue of salvation and narrow it down. We have a narrow view of salvation. So if you go up to somebody in our day and say, hey, are you saved? They say, oh, been to an altar. Are you saved? Well, join the church. Are you saved? Well, name's written down, going to heaven. Are you saved? See, they narrow it down to a moment here to joining a club, while I go to church, to activities, and salvation is reduced down. What I'd like for you to get a hold of today, one thing I'd like for you to get a hold of today, is the expanded view of the scriptures concerning salvation. See, the scriptures, when it says saved, when it says salvation, in our passage, for instance, it's not isolating it to a moment in time, not isolating it to a period uh, 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 an experience at an altar, it is a larger view. In fact, it takes in the whole dynamic movement of God in your life. For instance, the lame beggar is saved. What do you mean? Start reading the Bible? No. Went and made a sacrifice? No. What happened to the boy? An encounter with the Savior that literally invaded his life. And in the invasion of his life by the person of Jesus, there was a pushing back, a removal of, a cleansing, whatever your word you, is good for you. He literally moved back, removed from all the destruction what that was going on in relationship to the binding grip of sin in the man's life and liberated him so that emotionally, mentally, physically, he was saved. So it wasn't some narrow thing about fire escape getting out of hell. It wasn't some narrow thing about, oh, now I've been forgiven. It wasn't a narrow thing about, well, okay, now my, my, my salvation is secure. It, it was an intimacy of relationship whereby God literally invaded the demonic territory, which was the truth for every miracle Jesus did. See, what was going on was Jesus marched into our world and invaded demonic territory and all the miracles were that invasion, pushing back. Oh, can you imagine Jesus marching into your world, your life, and just pushing back? Oh. All demonic influence, force, trappings, allurements, and just pushing them back and making you whole. Whew. Who wouldn't want that? Salvation. Salvation. 
And it wasn't something that happened. Yeah, I had a miracle f uh, five days ago. Wasn't that the lame beggar is, uh, that's been healed isn't saying that. It was happening. Peter, in fact, in his message says, it's happening he, now. This man stands here now in this same salvation. So it is a, literally an experience of a moving flow of the presence of God within the human life that literally continually does something. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. Do you know the word cleansing there is in the continual process word? In other words, it doesn't, I didn't, it isn't I took a bath and oh, I'm cleansed. It's that I'm always taking a bath. The best illustration in the world is the coal miner. It's clean, clean clothes, <laughs> fresh, goes down into the coal mine, comes out at the end of the day. His clothes are saturated with the coal sut. His face, the pores of his skin, clogged with coal, coal sut. Everything about him is coal sut, except his eyeballs. They've had a continual washing. <laughs> That's the idea he uses for salvation. That there is something going on in my life that is just continually, God is just continually washing me, cleansing me, saving me. I'm in the constant state of, in fact, the proper language would probably not be I have been saved. It's probably I am being saved because somehow it's just happening in my life. He's invaded me. Salvation. What a big deal. Now, the one hindrance to salvation is what? Sin. But again, see, we narrow it. We narrow it. We narrow the concept. Oh, I don't sin. Why? Because I don't lie. <laughs> well, maybe you don't lie, but you could still live in sin. Well, I don't do anything bad. You could still live in sin. You could be the best person on the face of the planet and still be the worst sinner that ever lived. Because it isn't about the activity of a deed. See, you've got to get over that because that's too narrow. This is not about, don't do that anymore. This is not about that. Oh, it is about that. That's called forgiveness. We believe in forgiveness. I'm not belittling the forgiveness. Forgiveness is a big deal. God has no problem forgiving you. Forgiveness is, it's done. Forgiveness, you're in. Forgiveness, no problem. And it's a big deal. But folks, what I need is not just forgiveness. I need something. I tell a lie. But the issue is not the lie. The issue is why do you tell a lie? Why do I cover something up? You feel bad about it. Why do I feel bad about it? You know it's wrong. Why do I know it's wrong? See, it all goes back to this motive thing. See, I tell a lie to protect me. I tell a lie. See, it's all about motive, the internal motive of the human life. So sin is not an activity of a deed. It's what drives it. So if you stop the activity, you still... See, that was the whole issue in the Garden of Eden. Well, they picked the fruit. So, come on, we've said this before. Why didn't God just come over and say, Oh, brother, you guys blew it. You ate the apple forevermore. I didn't want those apples off that tree. Okay, hey, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to recreate the apple. Zap. Okay, the apple's back on the tree. I'm going to act like it didn't happen. But see, they aren't the same inside. That's the problem. It isn't that they did this, it, and you could forgive that, but they aren't the same inside. The nature has changed. So there's not only a deed of sin, there is a nature of sin. 
So guys, do you understand? You're not just fighting about, oh, I'm trying to do the right thing. I want to do the right thing. See, you're not just fighting against the temptation of wrong things. What we're fighting about is all this internal nature that wants to do the wrong thing. Oh, let me give you good news today. Do you understand? Salvation encompasses not only the forgiveness of the sin, but the deliverance from the very desire to do the sin. My dad told me he was uh, just a teenager, knelt in an altar, and uh, they wrapped their arms around him, of course, prayed, on, prayed for him and beat him on the back and said... Uh, uh, George, give your life to Christ. And he looked at him and said, well, said there's a problem with that. What's the problem? Well, all the things you guys like, I don't like. See, you guys like church. I think church is boring. You guys read the Bible. I don't understand it. You guys pray. I don't pff, talk into the air. See, all the stuff you guys like, I don't like. And all the stuff you guys don't like, I like it. <laughs> so how can I be a Christian? And the guy looked him right in the eye and said, George, we have a God that can change your likes to dislikes and your dislikes to likes. That's called salvation. <laughs> which is an overwhelming divine encounter whereby God invades the human life, pushes back the, dynamic, the, the demonic forces, and literally alters, changes your nature. Whoa. It's called salvation. <laughs> and he says... Outside of the person of Jesus, that doesn't exist. Oh, I'm really into meditation. Fine, but it's not salvation. 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 Let me give you a couple of handles on this. Number one. Salvation, therefore, is a person. Come on, that's simple. We've already said that. If the Bible is all about salvation, but no, wait a minute. The Bible's all about Jesus. Oh, Jesus is salvation. See, that was the Christmas message. The angel of the Lord showed up in jo to Joseph in the night hour when he's going through this, he's in this dilemma about what he's going to do, about his, his wife-to-be and the fact that she's with child and how's he going to handle this thing. And this angel shows up and says, Hey, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from, save his people, save his people from their sins. Again, why would we call his name Jesus? Because Jesus means Yahweh saves. So that's why we're calling him, because he is the Savior, and salvation is contained within him. Now, come on, we've emphasized this before, but some of you still haven't gotten it. I want you to go from the fact that Jesus gives me salvation to he is salvation, which is different. See, it's one thing for me to give, it's one thing for me to be. So Jesus doesn't give you anything. He doesn't come and save you in the fact that he carries salvation in his hip pocket. He did not go into a, a laboratory and c invent a pill called salvation and distributes it. And as long as you take the pills, you are high on salvation. <laughs> Again, as we said last Sunday, he's not the pizza delivery man. The salvation pizza delivery man who comes to your door. Here's the salvation pizza. I gather with my family. We all eat salvation pizza while he goes to other places in the community delivering salvation pizza. 
That's not what he's talking about. Salvation exists in a person. And that makes it not rules accomplished. That makes it not things you do. That makes it not activities to perform. That makes it, ladies and gentlemen, relationship. with a person. How are you and Jesus doing? Well, I visit him on Sunday morning. <laughs> what? You're kidding me. And you want to claim to be saved? Well, I do better than Sunday morning. Come Wednesday night too. <laughs> and you want to claim salvation? Well, I read the Bible. I read a verse a day. And you want to claim salvation? Well, I put $50 in the offering. That'll probably work. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. That won't work either. Salvation is a relationship of intimacy with the person. It's really interesting when you go back to the Old Testament, you get this boundary language which spills into this passage. See, this is boundary language. Salvation is found within the boundaries of relationship with Jesus. Now, in the Old Testament, they called it covenant. And they had uh, bilateral covenants, which meant there was two people. See, we come into the board meeting, uh, we come into the big room, and here's the, here's the big uh, oak table, and, and we sit down, you're on that side, I'm on this side, and we make a covenant, sign a contract. You agree, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to do. I agree, I will do, I will do, I will do. We shake hands on it, and we enter into a covenant. It takes two people to do that. Marriage is that way. It's a covenant. God came, think this through. God came and said, I'm going to have a covenant. I want a covenant with you. Come on into the table. You're sitting on that side. He's sitting on this side. What are you going to contribute? <laughs> My good looks. Well, good luck on that one. You haven't looked in the mirror lately. <laughs> you don't have anything to contribute. Well, my goodness, you don't have any goodness to... Your best deed on your best day is filthy rags, so you have nothing to offer. Well, I'll serve. What? You think your puny little service is of value to him who has created angels who don't eat as much as you do? The overhead's too big for you. You have absolutely nothing to offer, no contribution to make. So you know what God said? We're not going to have a bilateral covenant where there's two people. You contribute, I contribute. We're going to have a unilateral co uh, uh, covenant, and I will do it all. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. Oh! you need to do is stay within the boundaries of the covenant. Well, what's the boundaries of the covenant? Old Testament. Boundaries of the covenant was the law. Stay within the boundaries of the law. Suppose God came and said, oh, Tennessee, the state of Tennessee. Oh, I love the state of Tennessee. I'm going to take all my blessings, benefits, salvation. I'm going to take it all and put my presence and all my blessing and salvation in the state of Tennessee. You don't have to do anything. Just live in Tennessee. 
This is not too far-fetched, is it? Live in Tennessee, because here's where all the blessings of God are. <coughs> Stay within the boundaries of Tennessee. You'll be okay. And what do you do? You go to Kentucky. <laughs> Why do you do that? <laughs> Stay in Tennessee! <laughs> but we keep going to Kentucky. Go Big Blue. <laughs> <laughs> See, that was the law. Just stay within the law. But we couldn't. We didn't. We couldn't. We just didn't. We just. So you know what God said? This is so awesome. He said, hey, I love you so much. I'm changing the boundaries. I can see you're not going to stay in Tennessee. So I'm going to change the boundaries. You're not going to keep the law. You're not going to live within the boundaries of the law. So I'm going to change the boundaries on you. And you know what the boundaries are? Jesus. If, if you just give your life to Jesus. Jesus. If you'll just go after him, if you'll just love him with your whole heart, if you'll just let him invade your flesh, if you'll just let him come and fill your life, if you will just moment by moment live in the boundaries of his presence, if you will just let him come and resource you, if you would just, oh, if you'll just give him your mind and let him teach you, if you just let him give, your, give you his heart and let his heart begin to beat within you, if you would just bring your life under the influence of, if you would just live within the relational boundaries of his presence, Quit living on your own. Come on, quit doing your own thing. Come on, quit. Well, I got it right. No, you don't. Would you just live within the boundaries of the relationship? Because salvation is found in the relationship. Come on, that's not hard, guys. See, that's something. And if you say, well, I, I have to do something, well, why? And if you think you have to do something, okay, we'll give you a part. But the language of my part, God's part. I'll do my part, then God will do his part. That is stupid language. I'll do my part, and then God will do his part. Why isn't God doing his part? Well, I haven't done my part. Well, what is my part? I don't even know. <laughs> and if I could figure out what it was, I couldn't do it. I'm incapable. Come on. My life has been invaded by so much filth. I, there's, there's no chance of me pulling this off. Well, I have to have a part. Okay, so what, what, can your part just be respond to him? So we use the word response. Respond to him. He come, well, just live within the boundaries. Respond to his presence. Just yes to Jesus. Just your part is just constantly saying yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus. Whatever he says, whatever, however, yes, just keep yielding. Just keep responding. Just keep surrendering. Just keep, yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's, that's, that's all the, that's your, that's your, that's your business. Your business is focused, you're in the relationship of his presence. Salvation is found there in that relationship. Number two, salvation is a person. Salvation is a provision. Did you see it in the second statement? Verse 12, nor is, for there is no other name under heaven given, given among men. You know how often that is emphasized in the scriptures, the given thing? A gift. It means exactly what you think it means. It means something you didn't earn. Something you didn't merit. Something that is transferred to you from someone else. And now it's yours. Oh, this is an awesome thought. If salvation is Jesus and it's given and I now possess it, I can literally say, I have Jesus. 
Do you know Christianity is the only religion in the entire world that claims to have God? We have him. That consistently, constantly through the scriptures, there, there is this long list of stuff that we, because of his presence, have. I have life. I have peace. I have purity. I have holiness. I have wisdom. I have, I have, I have God. I have everlasting life. I have eternal living. Why? I have it, man. It's mine. I possess it. <laughs> What arrogance? No, you don't understand. I'm in relationship. I belong to him, but friend, he belongs to me. Now again, as we said before, the, the devil never, you never have the devil. He has you. I know, we talk about demon possession, which would indicate we have but we don't have in the terms of have. He has us. Well, if I can't have the devil, you can't. You can't have him. You can be possessed by him, but not have him. He has you, but you don't have him. How on earth could I have the omniscient, sovereign God? He gives himself to you. The devil never gives himself to you. It's a gift. It's a gift. The wages of sin is death. The gift. The gift of God is eternal life. By grace you're saved. That not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. For it is a gift, a gift, a gift, a gift of God. Therefore, if salvation is contained within the person of Jesus and it, he gives himself to you, there is nothing how do you say this? Nothing outside of that. It's never Jesus plus. <clears throat> Don't think this through. It's not hard. Well, now that I'm a Christian, I got to be good. No, you don't. You don't have to be good. Oh, you mean I can be bad and be a Christian? No. Well, then I have to be good. No, you don't. It's not Jesus plus being good that saves you. It's just Jesus and that on I'm his. Whoa, I want to be good. <laughs> because that's him. Did you get that? Well, now that I'm a Christian, I got to go to church. No, you don't. You don't have to come to church. Probably the director would disagree. It isn't I'm a Christian and therefore I have to come to church. See, it isn't that because you can come to church and not be a Christian. So it's not Jesus plus coming to church. It's Jesus and now that I love Jesus, why wouldn't I want to get together with you guys and worship? Why would I want to do that? And it's contained within. See, everything you're looking for was within the boundaries of relationship with this gift. This gift. This gift. This gift. Number three. Salvation is a person, according to the passage, <coughs> nor is there salvation in any other it's a person. Salvation is a provision, for there is no other name under heaven given among men. And salvation is a passion, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must 
The word must is phenomenal. It literally means absolutely necessary, backed up by the sovereign hand of God because God has a passion. Come on, that is so biblical. I mean, everywhere you go, you get this throbbing, beating heart of God that passionately wants to give to you the person. He is not <laughs> against you. He is fighting for you. He is not presenting obstacles in your way. He is removing them. He is not blocking your path. He is embracing you and pulling you to himself. He is not holding you at arm's length. He is drawing you with the very passion of his desires. You are wanted. Jesus, how, how, how could I not believe this? All the experience of my life is the experience of you just chasing me, just coming after me, just banging on my door, just knocking on my forehead, just passionately, passionately drawing me to yourself. How, how could I not believe this? And Lord, the times I've had sense enough to bow at your feet and say, I accept the gift the flood of your overwhelming, amazing invasion in my life, the reality of your love that just swept me off my feet. The wonder of your embrace and the fact that you drew me so close and there was a sense of security and safety in your presence. See, it all tells me This is true. I have never ever, God, I've never ever found you one time against me. You, you have talked to me and told me some hard things, God, but it was always because you loved me so much. And I have seen your wrath. I have seen your wrath. I saw it on a cross. I saw how much you hated sin. I saw you. I see how much you hate what destroys me. I see how much you despise everything that undermines my, my, my relationship with you and what you built me to be and my destiny. I, I see everything. I see your hate. I, I, I see that you hate everything that's against me. And at the same time that I see your hate and I see your amazing love, that just will not let me go. Oh God, in this hour, would you take us from where we are, from the worst of us to the best of us? Would you take us from the one who knows you in intimacy and oneness to the one who doesn't know you at all? And would you somehow invade us anew and afresh? Would you somehow bring us back into a full fold focus on who you are and who you want us to be in you. Would you bring us back? If we've been tiptoeing towards the border, the boundaries, almost going to Kentucky, would you bring us back? 
to the throbbing heart of your being. Would you make us a people who just absolutely are so in love with you we'd rather die than hurt you? That it's not a matter of, oh, we aren't supposed to sin. It's a matter of, oh, God, I wouldn't do anything against you. I'd rather die because I've felt your heart. I know your passion. You've invaded my flesh. And would you bring us into a state, oh, God, would you bring us into a state of experiencing the continual being saved? We're in a world of filth when there's evil all around us. How on earth am I going to make it if you are not in me constantly scrubbing me down, cleansing me, giving me, giving me, giving me oh, who you are. Heads are bowed. Would you respond? Would you would you just respond? Would you just yes, okay, God? Well, do you expect all of us to come to the altar? Absolutely. And maybe that isn't a practical, I get it. But could, could you respond? Could you just, in your heart and mind, would you just, yes, Jesus, yes. If this is true, if we're not talking about figuring out a theology, if we're not talking about, well, I'll work harder and do better, if we're not talking about some new disciplines in my life, if, if, if we're talking about you, Jesus, and you embracing me, and could I just say yes and let you do it? And Lord, before this crowd this morning, I say yes to you. Take me from where I am, the meager beginnings, into the fullness of your heart. Let me experience all of your mind and how you think. Let me know the throbbing passion of who you are. I say yes. I say yes to you, whatever that means, whatever that does in me, whatever that changes. God, whatever, whatever drops off, whatever comes on, it's all okay. You can change my personality, God. Anything you want to do, man, I'm in. Uh, yes, 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 God. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Trinity, God. Bring me into the heart of who you are. Save me in all of its fullness. Save me. Oh, just some moments of responding.